It is a privilege to stand up here and be sharing with you again today. And again, thanks, Tina. And uh, I do hope you understand that VBS isn't just a little department uh, event, but it really is a whole church. And I know a couple years, was it my first year here, we canceled VBS, right? Because we just didn't have enough help. And uh, we really believe in a gift-based ministry. And if those people who have gifts want to help, then things happen. And if they don't have the gifts and they can't help, then some stuff we will honor how it's worked in the past, but we'll move forward. So again, uh, thank you for all stepping up. And I, yeah, the several hundreds of kids will be here. I'm working from home all week. And uh, no, uh, <clears throat> as, as that uh, famous artist Neil Diamond says, it will be a, a beautiful noise. So uh, be in prayer. If you can't help, I know many of you brought cookies. And I will... Uh, be honest to say I have not touched one of those double stuffed Oreos. And Tina, there's bags that have been sitting there all week that I'm thinking, will she even notice? Okay, so we're glad that you are here and we are continuing in our series of finding rest in a restless world. We, uh, our first home when I was married uh, was a, uh, it looked like a dump well, before we bought it, uh, in a very nice neighborhood. And so we spent some time repainting, replacing all the flooring, uh, painting cupboards. Every electrical outlet got replaced. Every plumbing fixture got replaced. Windows, you know. I spent two hours looking for some pictures. They're somewhere in my house. I just can't find them. Uh, But part of that process was I'd go to Home Depot and, Go to the clearance section in lights. Because you know, lights can be pretty pricey. And so I'd always go to the clearance section. And I found uh, a couple sconces. Now, that's a fancy word for a light that hangs on a wall. Like these things here are called sconces. Uh, They're light. And so I found a great deal. And it would look great in our bedroom against this one wall. And so uh, I know a little bit about electricity. And so I flipped the, the switch for the room. Had a as a two-story home, I had to climb up into the garage. I mean, into the into the attic, and I'm uh, having the flashlight, and uh, I think I find the wire that I need to tap into to put in this sconce. I had to put a hole in the wall, and I had to get a wire from that hole in the wall up to the ceiling. But then I started to panic, thinking. There's a lot of wires up here. And how do I know I got the right one? And I can, you can, you, you can trace it, but nobody was home. Uh, and so I crawled back down, shut the power off to the entire house, took my cell phone up there, and had it dialed and was talking to a buddy just in case I did cut the wrong wire. Uh, but then I had to get this wire up through the wall, and that's a challenge, and I don't know if any of you have used one of these. I know some of the, uh, the band members, they're like, what is that? And uh, it's a wonderful tool that you can feed, uh, what's it, it's a fish thing, F- fish tape, fish tape, thank you, thank you. Uh, I've used it often. I just don't know if it's fish something. And so this thing, you just shove it up that goes to the insulation, and voila, and you pull the wire down, or you come the other way, and you pull it up. Could save you hours of time. Uh, And uh, it's just a special tool. And this this whole series, Finding Rest in a Restless World, is about special tools. Tools that, are, tools that are available for everybody if we choose to use them. And we've talked about the idea of, of our body as a tool and we need to take care of our bodies. Last week we talked about journaling and the idea of, of how uh, journaling uh, helps us to remember God's movement. In fact, as I spent two hours looking through pictures, I'm reminded that photographs are a part of journaling because no doubt I went through memory lane as I was going through boxes and boxes of pictures. 
Today we're talking about fasting, which for some of you are like, I like eating, and I'm not sure about today's message. But fasting is another special tool that God gives us that we can connect with him and find rest. Let us pray. Thank you, God, again for everybody here. And I know for some it's, it's been a week of loss. Uh, for others, uh, it has been a, a week of rest. Uh, for others, you know, life just goes on and, and here we are again today. So I thank you for the, uh, what's on the hearts of everybody here. I thank you, God, that you don't tell us to check those at the door, but that you invite us to bring them here into this place. And so I pray that the thoughts that are on each of the minds and the hearts of, of these, your people, and that the words that come from my mouth, Lord, that they will be acceptable in your sight because you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. John Wesley says this about fasting. He says, some have exalted religious fasting beyond all scriptures and reason, and others have utterly disregarded it. Meaning, like in any of these tools, we could almost worship the tool versus the purpose of that tool. So, obviously I'm not one who worships my body, but there are some people who are I mean, they go to the gym, and it's all about their body. It isn't about them keeping in shape so God can use them. It's really all about themselves. Uh, journaling, uh, you know, some write for the purpose of maybe this will be a book one day, and I need to, to uh, write everything down so I, could, so I can, can, can write something. And, and while that's not bad in and of itself, really the purpose of the journaling is to connect me with God, and to remember how God has moved in my life over the years. And even fasting. Fasting can be uh, something that people uh, hold up and say, oh, I fasted. Uh, I've known people. It's like, well, are we supposed to sort of like downplay that whole idea? And at times you can't. I mean, just put it out there. Out there. I was at, a, at another church, and I was... Uh, would have lunch periodically uh, uh, with, with a guy in the church. And, I, and it's been difficult, and he's traveling, and we're trying to arrange lunch. And uh, I kept saying, that's not going to work. Well, then what about two weeks later or a month later? And uh, finally, I knew the guy well enough. I said, you know what, let's meet, but I'm just not going to eat. And he goes, well, why? I'm buying, which is a big deal for me. It's like, nah, you know, and I knew him well enough that I could say, you know what, it's just the day I'm going to be fasting. I can't work it in any other way. And so then he started calling me on, hey, are you fasting? Because I'll take you out to lunch. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it's, it's not something that, uh, that we broadcast or that uh, you put on Facebook, hey, I'm fasting today. Pray for me, you know. And so the whole world knows uh, your, your stuff with God. Let me just talk about a little bit about what fasting is not. It's interesting that it is not a commandment in the Bible. Nowhere is it, it's, is it a commandment, and nowhere are we commanded to fast. Interesting. And there's nothing magical about it. I think some of us think there's something magical. Uh, oh, since I serve you, God, you should make everything go the way I want it to go. God, since I'm giving you money every week and, and honoring you that week, you should make me rich. You know, there is, uh, there's just nothing magical about fasting. That God, whatever I am fasting about, if there is a concern or a burden, that, that you're going to, to make that right. And I think sometimes these special tools, we would like to add on uh, the the... The, the tagline, and God, because I've done this, you need to do this. So there's nothing magical about it that manipulates God or even other people. And again, in, in our context, uh, I'm talking about fasting from food and or drink. 
Now, there's all kinds of things to fast from. You know, I shared a few weeks ago I lost my phone. So I was like a week without my phone. So technically I was fasting without my phone. Uh, some people do this during Lent. You know, they fast from something they just love because ideally not, not participating or doing or eating that whatever that something is that is supposed to bring them uh, hopefully closer to God or remember the sacrifices that Jesus have done, that Jesus did for us. So I'm, sac- I'm and again, if this was any of your Lent vows, I apologize, but I'm going to, f- well, if you're addicted to it, it's a serious thing. I'm going to fast from chocolate. Now, I'm not sure how we can associate the death on the cross with skipping a Hershey bar. Uh, but for some people, that's a struggle. It's a daily struggle. And so in the broader sense that we don't become fruit inspectors that we've talked about the last couple of weeks, that it's not my job to inspect your fruit, to see it's not my job to say, oh, what are your, that isn't right or that isn't spiritual enough because I don't know your story. And so it is with fasting is that let's not become fruit inspectors, but for the context, because I didn't want people to walk away from today saying, okay, you know, I'm going to fast from uh, watching the Dodgers. That may be a blessing for some people. You know, no. I'm going to, f- it depends on what channel you got, right, Margaret? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to, you know, we're not talking about those things. We're talking about our daily substance of food. We're fasting from food. And also, while it may help, and there are studies out there that will probably argue this, uh, when I talk about fasting, it isn't for a medical or a physical need, even though those are some benefits from it. I'm not fasting to lose weight, even though you could do that. And if any of you have gone into surgery, you have to fast for X amount of time before that surgery. So, yes. And I know how many of you have scheduled that surgery early in the morning because you don't want to fast all day. You know, it's like 2 o'clock. I can't eat or drink until 2. And that's, that's all you focus upon is what you can't do. Uh, so we're, I'm, what I'm saying is that fasting isn't just for me. And... Again, I email out to some people what I'm, I'm speaking on, and somebody emailed back and said, hey, fa-, I go, well, it's fasting. I'm not sure it's an overly exciting topic for the church. And this person said, well, if you're fasting for the right reasons, it changes everything. And so fasting, again, folks, it, it isn't so that I can, uh, uh, can change Matt. It isn't so that I can, uh, can, can, can fix somebody else. So you get about somebody else. It's really fasting is for me to, to, to set up my heart to be in a place where I can hear from God. And so I, and I know we, it, it is all about me. Fasting is really about Jesus, but it's how I'm connecting with Jesus. And fasting, again, is one of those tools that will help us find rest in a restless world. Now, uh, there was a time when there was nothing written about fasting. It wasn't even on the radar. And for some churches, and it may be ours as an evangelical, Bible-believing church, we'll say it wasn't a commandment. So we write it off. And there are other, other religions, and there are other, again, like I said, there are other purposes for fasting. But we can see in Scripture where fasting was a normal part of someone's life. Again, I want to take a look. Uh, it's on page 678 in the Bibles in your chairs, 679. We talked about it in a new way to be human. It's in Matthew. Jesus says this. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for their disfigure. For they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head 
and wash your face. So that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is, in, who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And so while it's not a commandment, Jesus says, when you fast. It's an assumption that fasting is a part of life. And in the Jewish culture, it was a regular routine. And medically, we can even say uh, fasting a day a month or two days a month, depending on what you're able to do, uh, it is very good for your body. Because we know we put a bunch of junk in us. Toxins is the medical word. And I'm not the doctor, but when our liver and our digestive system processes all of that, it's working. That's why they'll say don't eat after, is it six or seven? So that your body can slow down and rest when you're supposed to rest. Versus at 11.30 going to get a Little Caesars pizza for five bucks. And for the next four hours, your body's processing that thing in your stomach. And so fasting, no doubt, is a very wise thing to do. Uh, because it does help us get rid of the junk in our bodies. Because therefore, then your liver and the other parts of your body, they don't have to work. They can even take a rest. And then if they're working, they're helping get rid of the excess toxin, toxins that are in there. But let's just take a look because I don't want people to think, oh, this is a, a new age thing that the pastor is trying to, to, to bring into us to do. Let me just, uh, these, you're not going to see these on the screen, but I'm just going to remind us in Scripture of how often people were fasting. Again, in the book, book of in the book of Acts, it records believers fasted before they made important decisions. They fasted about before they elected the elders of the church. Also, in Luke, an 84-year-old widow fasted for 40 days. So, fasting isn't just for those young people anymore, huh? It's for all of us. In Luke 4, for for 40 days, Jesus was tempted by the by the devil. And during those days, he did not eat or drink. And at the end, he was hungry. So the humanity, and yes, when we fast, we're going to be hungry. Hunger is not evil. And Daniel, you've heard of this. Maybe you've heard of this, the, the Daniel diet, is that what it's called? Uh, okay, maybe you haven't heard of that. But there are, uh, there's books on it. There's movements on it. You know, in Daniel, I, he, it says in there, I, I ate no choice food nor meat or wine touched my lips. And so some are using the Daniel fast as a way to, quote, lose weight if you just did what Daniel did. In Esther, she did not eat or drink for three days or night. Deuteronomy, when, when Moses went up to the mountain, again, for 40 days, he fasted. And in 2 Corinthians, I have, uh, Paul, I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. And then throughout church history, again, as I just, just, just read, you know, Moses was the lawgiver who fasted. David the king, Elijah the prophet, Esther the queen, Daniel the psychic, Anna the prophetess, Paul the apostle, Jesus Christ the incarnate son. And then the leaders that some of us may remember, even though you probably didn't know Martin Luther, but Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, John Wesley, John, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Finley are a, a few of the, uh, the leaders in the Christian faith who fasted. But for some reason, I think it's, we have erased it off of our uh, to-do list. We have forgotten that it's a tool that we can use. Uh, and some of us, be, because we've bought into the, uh, I'll just say, we bought into the, uh, to whatever has made up the three square meals a day and have to be made up of this. 
Now, uh, all of you either have, not all of you, many of you have either had a child, have a niece or a nephew or a grandchild. You work with kids. Trust me, come here and you'll see several hundred kids this week. Because they whine and want something doesn't make it right. Because my stomach growls at times doesn't mean I need to feed the beast. I need to say no to that. But I think many of us thought, oh, you need the protein, you need this, you need that. And so we constantly eat, 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 and we miss the opportunity to put us in a place where not that we're speaking to God always, but that God can speak to us. And I believe that's where maybe we've gone astray a little bit in some of the churches is that it's convenient. It's great to forget about fasting because I like to eat. And wonderful things happen around meals. Now, some practical things. I wouldn't suggest you fast on Thanksgiving. Your family's going to think you're a little wacko. Uh, at least my family would think that. that. Uh, I'm guessing that, that all that attention would come right to you. Oh, Uncle Juno's fasting today. Woo, he must be a pastor. Or what's going on? You know, so, so, you know, pick, uh, pick those days. And don't pick the days that your, your office is having a staff lunch. Because, hey, where you at? Oh, you know. He's fasting, and you know, all that stuff starts to flow, and, and then you're put in a box and stereotyped. Look at the back of your program, folks. You're gonna, I did put down some tips about fasting, because I don't think, I think we need to know a little bit more about it. And obviously, if you haven't fasted, or if you are in a medical condition, you need to check with your doctor, and I am not your doctor. And I know Scripture tells us about many people who fasted for 40 days. I'm not even going there. <laughs> no. uh, some people, maybe they have. But we can at least take a step. We can at least decide, okay, you know what? Uh, I'm not sure I can even go a full day, and that's okay. Do a half a day. Do a meal or two. Uh, for those of you who have to shop and prepare and clean, there is a boatload of work that goes into eating. So rather than, than satisfy those hunger pains, you, you flip that, and instead of using that time to shop and clean and cook and eat, okay, Lord, uh, maybe you're going to be in prayer about a situation or somebody. Maybe something at work. Maybe something in the family. Something here at the church. I tell you, we met again with uh, 10 different pastors here on Wednesday to review our prayer and worship night that we collectively did uh, with some churches a couple weeks ago. And I'm convinced that as we move forward and being new life for the city, fasting will indeed be an element for us as a church, as well as collectively for other churches. Because we know the minute something starts to happen that's good, Satan will try to mess it up somehow. Again, if you've been married, or if, if, if they had pre-marriage classes when you were married, how often did you get in a huge fight on the way to the pre-marriage class? Some of my wife's and I's worst arguments about adoption was on the way to the adoption agency when we had to put on this wonderful face that, yeah, we're a couple that have it all together. We'll take those kids, you know. Uh, and it's just like we're just like about the process and just different things. Adoption was a wonderful Wonderful option for many people. And yet Satan will try to mess that up. And so look through the back of this. I'm not going to go through, through every one of these. But there are some basic things here, folks. Uh, again, most of the time uh, when you're fasting, 
Uh, you can go a lot longer without food than you can water. So keep drinking the water. Uh, and uh, I'll share something. You know, when you break the fast, meaning you're done with it, don't go out and have a whole plate of spare ribs. Because your system has been sort of like on cruise control or, or your system is sort of like uh, toning things down a little bit. And then if you go and, and shove it down there with a Whopper or nothing against Whoppers if you own a franchise or any other fast food place, that your system is going to be doing some weird things. And so uh, ease back into the food with what? Just healthy food. Uh, and I do think uh, misery likes company. And at times, it's difficult to fast. So if you have a trusted friend, you know, bring him or her or your spouse in on that. And maybe you can do it together. Uh, trust me, because if you have to cook this wonderful meal for your spouse and you're fasting, I'm not sure there's going to be good vibes going into that, that cooking process. But why isn't he fasting too? i got to cook his meal, let him cook himself. You know, all those self-talk things that some of you may, may just happen to have. The purpose of fasting, again, while it's healthy, while it, is, it could help with weight loss, while it helps you to detox your system, it really is about Jesus. And about putting yourself in a place for those meals, the prep time, the cleanup time, the shopping time, all that extra time that you can be focused on, on the spiritual aspect of your life. So that you can be in a place so when the stuff of life hits the fan, you can respond with wisdom and discernment just naturally because you've been preparing yourself. You've had that time with God that, folks, let's face it, it's a busy world out there. And God can often get shoved to the back burner unless we're intentional. And one way to be intentional is with the special tool of fasting. And no, again, uh, in your families, uh, let's be realistic, folks. You need prayer. Some of your family members need prayer. There's prayers about, uh, as, as Tina prayed this morning, there's prayers about careers, prayers about investments, prayers about where we're going to live, practical prayers. Do we buy the vehicle or don't we? Do we remodel or don't we? You know, all those, those very real conversations. You know, uh, are you button heads with your kids, with your spouse? And so... Uh, look at fasting as a time to reboot. To reel things back in, to calm down, and to, to really to focus on who God is. And to prepare your soul for the battle that's out there. And that, that happens in our homes, even in your workplaces. You, know, you can fast for the people at work, even though who knows where they're at spiritually. You can fast that you will respond with the love of Christ to those people that at times you, you can't wait for their retirement party, if you were honest. And even then for our church, as we continue to move forward, as we continue to, to live out what it means to love God and to love others, as we really try to embrace what it means to be new life for the city, we as a congregation need to be connected on a deeper level with our Creator. We need to be able to be connected with God so the, the little things don't bug us. So that we major on the majors, not on the minors. So that we can say, instead of saying, I don't like something, to say, what can I do to contribute to God's movement in this area? And there's no way that we'll be able to continue to move forward. There's no way that we'll continue to, to be effective, to be a, a light 
for Christ in our community if we don't grab on to some of these tools from the entire series we're talking about. Today it's on fasting. My guess is most of us don't fast or we forget to. And to know that, uh, give it a try. One meal, two meals, in a few weeks, try it again. Again, not just skip the meal, not to say, oh, I got busy at my desk. Oh, I guess I fasted today. I even missed lunch. No. It's to say, I'm intentionally going to skip this meal. I'm going to change my routines so I can read the word, so I can sit in silence, so I can pray for my friends and for my family or for this situation or for the people in my life group. And so I'm going to take that extra 45 minutes and do that. And I'm convinced as we do, as we grab a hold of the special tools that God gives us, that we will be transformed people. And despite our humanness, we will find a new way to be human and to be a light into this dark world. And the world will be different because of how God has created you and how God will use you to make a difference. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, for just this time to gather as your people. Forgive us for taking that for granted. Forgive us, God, for taking our health for granted. Forgive us, God, for taking our meals for granted. And so help us as we think through the idea of fasting, that we will be focused on you and what you would have us to do, that our hearts would become more like yours, so we will love people as you would have us to love them. And not just for the sake of a warm, cozy community, but for the sake of the gospel. Use us all in that way. Amen. We're going to continue to worship as you give your offerings. If you're our guest, there is no pressure to do that. And so the ushers are, are going to come forward and, and they're going to receive your gifts, given, you giving back a portion to God. And after the ushers pass, you are welcome to, to remain in your seat. You are welcome to follow along in the songs in your head, sing, sing out loud. You're encouraged, if you would like to, to come forward here or in the back, and there's rovers, uh, that will serve you communion to remind you of what Christ has done for you. And so you can come up and you can celebrate that. You can light a candle here, again, in the back, to say, Lord, your light needs to shine in a dark place. Maybe you need to nail something to the cross. Something that you need to, to recommit, Lord, I need help with this. Or maybe you need to talk with somebody, a live person. You have a prayer, something that is just on your heart. Well, we'll have uh, our prayer team over here by the organ who would be honored to pray with you, to listen to you, and to pray. And so wherever you're at today, uh, may our response begin with our offering and end with us connecting to God in another level.